Good afternoon, everyone. This is Beth Wadham from the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. Welcome to our January webinar. So we're delighted to be here today with Daniel Barbazat, Professor of Economics at Amherst College, and now the Executive Director of the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society. Dan was awarded a Contemplative Practice Fellowship in 2008, and he has become actively involved with the Center in really a relatively brief period of time. He joined the Board of Directors and served as Treasurer and Associate Director with um, Mirabai Bush and Arthur Zients in 2009, and in 2012 he became the Executive Director of the Center. He's been working energetically to expand and deepen all our programs, and especially making efforts toward making the Center's work more accessible for all. Over the past decade, Dan became interested in how self-awareness and introspection can be used in post-secondary education, economic decision-making, and creating and sustaining well-being. His approach to teaching economics has been featured in the Boston Globe, the US, and New US News and World Report, as well as on the NPR program Here and Now. In addition to experimental research on choice and awareness, Dan is currently editing a group of papers on contemplative pedagogy throughout the academic disciplines, which will be published by Routledge. He's co-writing a book with Mirabai Bush on contemplative pedagogy to be published by Jossie Bass, and composing and contemplating a book entitled Wanting. So Dan, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you today, and thank you so much for being willing to share this webinar with the network. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very happy to be um, with you in this way today. And um, I thought uh, that I'd start with uh, a moment where, if you wanted to, you could type in um, you know, where, you, where you're uh, listening from, uh, give you a sense of you know, this technology is, is, it seems always kind of talked about in ways of that you know it, it's divisive and kind of it moves us apart from one another. But in this kind of moment, we are together. We're here we're in Pittsburgh, Victoria, Brookline, Chicago, Sydney, Australia, Connecticut, North Carolina, Michigan. <laughs> uh, from Taipei, Paris, Tucson, Madrid, San Marcos, California. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you so very much for, for joining us today in, uh, um, in Elgin, Illinois, <laughs> well, where I spent a lot of time, my time growing up. I wanted to talk today about wanting, but to highlight the use of contemplative inquiry in uh, our lives, and in particular my life, of teaching economics. And I was drawn to this really by um, a sense that we were failing our students. Uh, Harry Lewis, former dean at Harvard, in his Excellence Without the Soul, really articulated this really well and said, you know, that. We've, we've forgotten our larger educational role. You know, we definitely can distribute information like never before. We have very, very keen knowledge about all sorts of things and highly specialized. But we seem to have forgotten, in particular with undergraduate education, that we really need to create environments where these students can grow up learn who they are, you know, to search for, here, just right in front of you there, a larger purpose for their lives. And I think that is fundamentally what I would like education to, to remember. And our work at the center and my own work is around establishing this memory. In order to transform education, I think we have to see education as an opportunity you know, to develop what we see before you here, this kind of awareness, so that we can deeply inquire into what is most meaningful to us. So education becomes a ground for that kind of environment. 
And once we've established these environments in which students can deeply engage in this way, then education can be intricative. And by what I mean by that is individuals' personal meaning can be linked to the information they're receiving. And through that interaction, it's transformative into action. And that action becomes a communal enterprise. And that's why it's so absolutely important that we keep our attention on having this process being open and inclusive for all. Now, of course, through this process, we're fundamentally transforming ourselves, not only our students, the institutions in which we interact. And in fact, it's, I really believe that in order for us, the critters that we are, to survive, we're going to have to develop, sustain, and keep an inquiry open into what is our most deep meaning? What is our vision? So fundamentally, education and you know, through that process our own personal lives, you know, require us to, as it says here, explore, create, and sustain these visions through our learning and then out into action. And it's kind of simple if you think about it. If we all continue acting in a manner counter to what we truly believe, what we truly find most deeply meaningful, we will cause suffering for ourselves and for others. We'll have dis-ease. So the process really is around cultivating, uh, uh, I'll use this word, awareness, and an inquiry into vision. And what I'm going to try to do in the you know, next <laughs> 20 minutes, I wish I, I could have three hours, <laughs> really good. But in the next 20 minutes is try to kind of look, do, do a little bit of this with you around you know, learning, teaching, and how it relates to economics. Well, this, what we're calling for kind of is, a, is rather simple, but radical change. And one of our, one of our you know, it just turns out to be our greatest spokespersons is, is this guy here, who's made a, a, a clear articulation of what I'm saying in a kind of a way, not in what I'm saying, he's saying is what he's saying, but it goes along very, so closely. And what, what the Dalai Lama and others have been calling for is something beyond the proficiency of basic academic subjects, which is, which is profoundly important, but something beyond that. That it'll be a ground for an inquiry into deep meaning and therefore connection. And so, providing information is never enough. Just providing information will just provide information. It won't guide action. Not without a sustained practice, environment, and tools to engage in the inquiry to relate that information to meaning and therefore action. Now, this might sound like, whoa, it's a little too much. But, you know, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. Very little changes can make very profound implications. So I believe in our courses with our students that we meet, there might, you, know, you might be talking to seven students, you might be talking to 200 students, but each one of them can make great change. So in education, this primary step is to develop the tools to develop and sustain an inquiry about what is most deeply meaningful. How is our learning, our teaching, and work related to that meaning? Now, obviously, some practice needs to be created and you know, sustain this kind of inquiry. And that practice and that inquiry really needs to be integrated with the material and the disciplines that we're training our students in. And fundamentally, that is what contemplative exercises 
do. And through this process, it deepen learning and make this radical transformation that really is just having students acquire into their own meaning and relating that to the material we're presenting. Now, in a kind of a way, here's just a little description. You know, you've got, at, the, at, this, at this top, you've got introspection, reflection, a practice of some kind that, that stimulates and allows for insight to arise, attention to be cultivated, reflection on what's occurring. And through that process, a vision, a vision of what guides action, like what is the vision of this? What is the, what is the deep, meaningful intention? And that interactions with, you know, contact and information, and in, you know, with in results, and it's you know, it's in this process here, this process that we're most you know we're most focused on. But of course, we we would we have to believe that our students are going to take action. They're going to make difference in this world. And so, really, what's occurring here is it's a flow. It's a flow that requires an attention to the whole process of contact among our students, information that we're providing. The actions and the results that are, you know, are being are, are, are being generated by the action, and then that all goes back into the reflection, you know, reflection through the practice, and then back through the vision. So in in this way, what's the the students are being ground in a deep meaning. So in in a kind of a way, you know, to practice what you preach, you have to practice. Now the practice could be a variety of, you know, it can be a variety of different things. It doesn't have to be a particular sort of practice. But the practice needs to, the intention of the practice needs to be involved in this process of the cultivation of this deep meaning. Now, ped contemplative pedagogy is, as I see it, is really engaged in this kind of transformation. And the processes, the the explicit exercises that are the tools for this practice you know, support and develop attention. Of course they do, because you have to attend to this process. But they also, through that process, they establish a kind of greater emotional balance. Now this is extremely important, as we'll see later on, in economic activity. But not only does the, these, these contemplative practices in, in the use of in pedagogy, develop and sustain attention, they also provide direct relationships between the students and the material of the courses. And through this process, they deepen the students' understanding of the material of the course. Very rarely, using this kind of an approach, do students ask, why are we learning this? How does this relate to the real world? Because students have found themselves in the middle of it, maybe in a mathematics course in the kind of engagement of problem solving or in the engagement with their own anxiety of their you know mathematical skills or in economics looking at the you know fundamental um, assumptions of a model whatever it might be all of them engage the student and place them in the center of what they're learning so that when they approach the abstract conceptual material of the course they find themselves and their experience in the middle of it. Now, of course, this process doesn't, <laughs> it, it has, has more, even more kind of, it, it, it not, just, not just direct kind of instrumental benefits, but what it opens is that kind of contact as we saw in that last, in that last little flow diagram. Because students recognize and they can share their experience with others in the class, this cultivates a kind of empathy and compassion and really provides a ground for a kind of true sense of connection with you know, actions like altruism around, wow, there's something greater than a kind of you know, single, single notion of a separate me from everything else. This process yields a kind of connection of the students, not only the students of the connection to themselves, to the material, but to others. And this is a profoundly important aspect of education, certainly in, in higher education, but wildly so in K-12 education. 
And this whole process, because it's engaged in this particular way with meaning, supports creativity and insight. These are probably the, those two words are probably the most important aspects of higher education. You know, people say, oh, you know, you, you're not just learning things, you're learning how to think. Well, people know how to think, they probably think so too much. What does that mean? It probably means something like think in an engaged way so that you have a fertile ground for creativity and insight. And this process opens up the learning so that this creativity and insight can arise. Well, this is something that Arthur's talk, Arthur Zions, uh, the um, head of uh, the President of Mind and Life and the, the former head of the um, Center for Contemplative Mind, talks a lot about the, this ability to engage with complexity and contradiction. This is essentially important when we have so many profound trade-offs. And trade-offs are because the profundity of these trade-offs are global ones. And in order for students to address and be able even to deal with the global problems that these next generations will face, they are going to have to sustain engagement with complexity and contradiction. If they don't, there'll just be more bloodshed. Now, so far, I've been kind of talking about pedagogy, and you might have been wondering, okay, what does this have anything to do with economics? That sounds kind of interesting, I hope, in a, in a kind of pedagogic way. But what does this have to do with economics? I'm all about to tell you. Economics, as you probably all know, remember from the, your course that you, <laughs> you took and probably didn't like, started off with a definition of economics as a study of the allocation of scarce resources. Well, allocation only needs to be thought about when there is scarcity. But scarcity is, is really the, is a study, it's, it's a management between what's wanted demand and what is produced or what is the supply. So scarcity is created out of this interaction between demand and supply. Economics is a study of choices. But it's not merely a study of choices. It's a study of choices that end in certain kinds of things, either technical or economic efficiency. And what economists are really interested in is economic efficiency, about how that allocation, how the interaction of demand and supply results in what economists call welfare. And this, you know, there, there might be a debate about this, but and so I, I, we can talk about this later. But we, what we might call well-being. Now, it might, so we, that, that, that's a little complicated in terms of what, you, what, the con, what, what that concept is. But, but notice that we're concerned about the outcome in, in terms of the overall wealth, the social welfare of those that are being managed in this allocation scheme. So at the heart of economics is really a study of wanting and well-being. Without that, you don't really have a sense of what it is that's producing, that's, at, that's creating the scarcity that the, that the society faces. Now, you, you probably recognize that scarcity can be managed in a variety of ways. And in, in different cultures, this has been attended to in rather radical ways. You know, in Britain and France, in... 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. To a large extent, women were removed. A lot of women's wanting was removed from markets. That's one way to manage the scarcity. They were removed from labor markets. They were removed from, you know, in various places owning property or something. So that's one, just a kind of very quick example of the profound ways that wanting can be managed by an overall vision of the society at large. Now, if you think about choices and decisions, this, the, the word decide comes from this, you know, you probably know this already, but I think I just, I really love this. It comes from this notion of to kill off, like pesticide, you know, suicide. 
and what you're, what you're doing is you're killing off other opportunities. When you do one thing, you're not doing something else. And so part of the cost of doing one thing are giving up the opportunity to do other things. <laughs> and economists like to point this out, you know, dismal science. But check this out. In order to make a choice, you have to anticipate the gain you're going to get from the action, which is an anticipatory projection, right? It's a projection of, your, of the benefit you're going to receive from an action, which is an expectation. But at the same time, not only do you have to come to expect what you might receive from this action, you also have to estimate what you're losing by not doing something else. In order to make that calculation well, there needs to be a pretty clear sense of awareness, either an attention to action so that in repeated context you know very well what the implications of this action are, or a very clear sense of the world such that you can make these projections re relatively well. And notice the awareness not only is on what is currently occurring, but what did not occur. So how do we do this? It's kind of amazing. Now, given the complexity of our wanting, and if you think about our wanting, our wanting arises all the time in the context of other people. This is not a simple calculation of what the net benefit of every one action is. So in a kind of a way, how do we choose? The real question is, in order to do what? If you want to satisfy every want, you're not going to be able to because they compete with one another. If you want to just satisfy just things that satisfy you know, short-term pleasure, you would do one thing. If, on the other hand, you're interested in you know, attending to maybe you know, some kind of overall life satisfaction, kind of eudaimonia kind of idea, well, then you're going to have to do something very different. So you have to kind of address the question, wow, in thinking about how I would make economic choices, I better get a pretty clear idea of what I'm trying to do. And this is what contemplative practice does. It nurtures and sustains this inquiry. The same sort of inquiry I talked about in the overall sort of talk about pedagogy is at the center of economic decision making. Now, I said we have competing wants. And I'll go through this rather, relatively quickly. You know, there's, there's wanting and there's liking. You can want things and have a desperate want for something and have a kind of agitation that you're not getting it and get the thing and really not enjoy it very much. So wanting and liking could be two very different things. Choice and experience utility. Kind of a choice utility. You, remember I said you, had to, you, have to, you have to act first and then you get the hedonic hit afterwards, right? <clears throat> you know, there's uncertainty about direct and indirect net benefits. What, is the direct, what, will, what will the direct benefit of this thing be? And what do I give up by not doing it? There's a good deal of uncertainty about that. You might have preferences about your preferences. That is to say, you might like to do something and think, whew, I wish I didn't like to do that. Or you might do something that satisfies a short-run gain, but not a long-run one. And this would lead us to this kind of dual self model. You might really want to put off that report or put off that negative thing, right? In that moment, that feels pretty good. But when it, you know, when it comes to the due date, you are scrambling and in a lot of suffering. So this kind of management of the short run and the long run requires a kind of management of these, of these um, dimensions of wanting. There are externalities in wanting, just as there are externalities in, in production. Many of you probably love you know, to support the ethical treatment of animals, but many of you probably eat various kinds of meat that doesn't really serve that purpose. Because in the moment of its consumption, you might not be attending to, oh, what are the, what are the overall costs of suffering on this planet from this particular consumption? 
and I, I, I'm right there with you. This is not, I'm not waggling my finger at you. And of course, this has a lot to do with things like stress. You know stress isn't good for you, and yet we take on more than we can do, and we know we're going to be stressful, and we might even sort of get a perverse kind of pleasure in the short run of stress, knowing that it leads to perhaps you know, health uh, costs in the long run. You have positional concerns. You know, I, you know, when worried about that, what that person has, when, when you know, it doesn't, might have no implication for you, but yet you might be, you know, wrangling about it, and your wanting might be a function of what other people have. You might want to be generous, but you might want stuff. How do you manage that? And of course, ethical concerns. You might want things that you don't feel are moral. What do you do with that? Now here's, here, was our, here was our guide, right? We have a kind of reflective practice that supports vision. We get information. There's contact, actions that go back into it. We have this reflection process. We could also have this model. Something arises in you. You're in a certain context. You get a little wanting and you act. <laughs> no vision. Just the satisfaction of wanting. And that leads to something a little bit more like this. <laughs> you know? And you find yourself with a hook in your jaw. But this process gets really complicated really quickly in terms of a sense of like, how, am I, how do I know I'm actually satisfying what I want to satisfy? Let's say, for example, you just ask people how happy they are and related that to their incomes. Now, most people have to work for their income. And uh, working can be difficult. And they, work, they don't work to work. They work to make money to secure services and goods. You know, for, like these examples here, strive for safe environments for their families, which they're very happy to do. Paying for their children's education securing health care, et cetera. I'm sure all those things, as, they're, as people succeed in applying, if they can, the environment and situation the markets allow them to do, have these you know, great benefits, they probably feel good about them. However, the work itself might be difficult and challenging. So even though you might be making a lot of money, in the middle of making that money, if you were asked how you do one, you might not really, if you're asked, if you're framed a question about how are you doing right now, how do you feel making all this money, it might not feel so great. If, on the other hand, you were to ask a question like, I see you're working very hard. It must be difficult. However, are you happy with the overall outcomes? You might get a different answer. Well, I'm <laughs> not the first guy to think of this. And Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton, to, uh, Daniel Kahneman is a psychologist at Princeton and Angus Deaton is an economist, thought about this. So they, they surveyed people, and you can see along the, the horizontal axis are annual income. And on the vertical axis are, 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 are the fraction of population experiencing what, what the metrics of positive affect, happy, sad, not blue, not feeling depressed, and stress-free. And so you can see here, this is the standard kind of response to this, that over, you know, over low incomes, yes, there's, a, there's an increase, but at a certain income, it levels off, and that you don't get any, you know, you don't get any benefit from higher income. However, if you add a question on ladder, and you'll notice that, la if you can see below it, well, in the description of figure one, um, the ladder is the average reported number on a scale of one, zero to ten, marked on the right-hand scale of where you are in terms of your overall life satisfaction. If you look at yourself as a, in your whole life, you think, take a moment to think about yourself, your, your overall goals, where you want to be, your overall kind of sense of you know, what you'd like to achieve over a lifetime. Where are, you, where are you on that ladder? Notice something very profoundly different that continues to increase at different rates, that's true overall levels of income. Now, 
this sense of wanting and, you know, really being related to markets, and I, I see it's 3.33, so I've got a couple more slides here. You, know, you can think about them as like, well, the want, we just, what we do with markets is we just let them go, you know? When, 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 when there's lots of wanting, the prices will be higher. But that's not really the case. I mean, we think of this a little bit differently. There are 34 states that have uh, price gouging you know, legislation, which doesn't allow uh, price increases during times of emergency. So, so 34 states in the District of Columbia. So we have a kind of sense of like, wait a second, there's a, there's a way in which these, we do recognize, we do as a, as a group recognize that the, you know, the ethical concerns of how we want to manage the, our wanting. Here, you know, if you want something a lot, you pay for more of it. And this, and you might think, well, that, well, that's true with emergencies, but not all goods. Well, check this example out. In 1999, um, it came out in a in a in a uh, Brazilian uh, interview that um, the head of the CEO of Coke said he was. They were testing machines that had a little uh, temperature meter, and if the t temperature was rising, th the price would rise. Well, there was an outrage. The head of Pepsi came out the next day and said, Pepsi would never do that to the American people. Now just let that wash over you for a second. What does that, what would they do? They're a profit makes, you know, maximizing firm, but somehow the frame of the wanting and the price being related to that was unacceptable in this particular case, and in fact so unacceptable that in two, in, you know, several months later, Douglas Investor, the guy who let this out in an interview, had to step down from his position. All this, I hope, gets you a sense that, you know, we're going to have to have a vision of what we're trying to achieve here. Certainly, Pepsi is a profit makes, you know, maximizing firm, and they raise their prices with respect to demand, and yet here, we would think it's an outrage for them to do it. I'm not making an argument whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, by the way, of how to have such vending machines. I am a little interested in the notion that Americans are so pro-capitalism and yet would find a vending machine that would have variable prices based on demand to be an outrage. That seems rather odd. So what I do in my classes is try to use these insights, these um, observations, and relate them to the literature on various aspects of consumer behavior in particular. We, you could also do this with production behavior, and what are the implications of certain kinds of production. You know? um, but I'm interested in consumer behavior um, for a variety of reasons that I'd be happy to talk about um, you know, with you all. Uh, but here's some of the examples. Um, you know, I, I, the, uh, these are all introspective, you know, contemplative practices. And just let me give you uh, the example from the first, this one right here, um, and then we can talk about these. So I start out. I have a class called Consumption: of The Pursuit of Happiness here at Amherst. Um, and this semester, it's it's pretty large. There are about 75 students in it. And uh, I start out the first day by t asking them, could you, which is, let's, let's, we're going to do a very simple exercise. Look through the syllabus and take, a, take your time. Look through each of the bullet points. Look at each of the articles. And then write down the percentage that you want to read. And I allow them some time to do that. And then after a little while, I say, OK, now you've written down what you want to read. Now I'd like you to write down what, you're com what you commit to reading. What do you commit to reading in the class? And they write down a number. And I tell them, I, 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 I have them count off. And they each have a number. And I say, OK, that, whatever number you are, put that on a piece of paper. And then write down the two numbers, the two percentages, what you want, the percent you want to read, and what you're committed to reading. And then I lecture for a little while. And I say, um, near the end of class, I say, okay, remember that 
Remember we looked at the, 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 the readings? You know, just really, right now, just between, just between us, I, I, I don't know your numbers, you know, they're, they're, I, don't, I won't know the order in which you sat. Just put your number down, and really just put down, what are you really going to do? What are you really going to do? 80%, so, you know, I, I collect them, and I match the numbers. 80% of the students committed to a number that was different from what they actually said they were going to do, like 20 minutes before. In fact, of the 75 students, probably 70 of them had a different number for what they wanted, what they committed to doing, and what they actually projected they were going to do. Now, as an economist trying to reveal preference, this is a kind of interesting exercise. And it really has the students begin to recognize for themselves how framing and their own sense of what they attend to matters in what, how they you know, project. Now, I understand, by the way, that this is, this is a little different because it's a projection of an action and not an action itself. However, as an exercise, I think it's, it's telling, at least. But the students, when they, when they were framed just in terms of their own wanting, they wanted one thing. They, they said one thing, committed to something. Now, the commitment probably was that they recognized that they didn't just, their wanting was different from, they wanted other things, like doing well in the course or something like that. And then when they thought about what they're actually going to do, they really thought, oh, hmm, what will I actually do? As if the commitment was an abstraction from themselves. So that, that, I use that exercise in the first day because it's very simple to do, and it gets the students to realize, like, wow, paying attention might matter. So I'm happy to, uh, so that's what I wanted to, to talk to you about today. Um, you know, there's <laughs> so much more, but I hope, it, I hope this gives you a sense of, like, the, 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 the need for this kind of inquiry in any discipline, and in particular economics. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, whenever we begin to inquire into these places, I feel it really kind of jostles my composure. And uh, it's definitely not comfortable to examine all of our own contradictory behavior. <laughs> yes. and, you know, that's a really good point. And I think it's one of the reasons why, even though I, I say, you know, there's all, this, there's all this benefit from this inquiry, mm. then, you know, like an economist would ask, why don't people do it? Right. Well, at the, out, at the outset, it's, it's usually not fun. Yeah. <laughs> But it is compelling, you know, um, and it, it, it's, it draws you, you know, what, where is my wanting and for, and for what purpose? And I, I, I imagine your students really do get, get hooked by that and, um, and are, are going strongly down uh, that pathway of, of discovery. Um, well, it's just really wonderful to hear how introspection can apply um, to economics courses and also the the kind of framework that you provided around what contemplative um, practice can offer, you know, throughout the curriculum, um, you know, I think it just seems that you've really identified how these, there are these core concerns or these foundational questions, you know, and they exist across uh, all the disciplines and that identifying those and really inviting students to explore them is what, you know, connects them to relevance and uh, brings their own experience. So I know that we probably have uh, some questions coming in from our, our listeners. And, um, we really do, yes. Okay. So I uh, wanted to give you a chance to, to review them a little bit, and maybe you have to make some choices there. <laughs> I know. I will. I will. So someone, someone just asked what time it is. <laughs> then somebody asked, what, what's the word you used, eudaimonia? That this, this is that kind of notion of, of a kind of like a general and life satisfaction. It's kind of a, um, uh, it's a Greek word, and it's like a, kind of an Aristotelian view of, of of happiness, of living, of living life in in, in a in in line uh, with a kind of sense of virtue, uh, uh, you know, being tested, having a moment where you could do one thing that you that you um, don't believe in, and, and another thing that you do believe in, and doing the thing you believe in, and staying true to what it is you tr you know that having a contemplative actually uses that. Well, in the translations, I don't read Greek, but in the translations, that word is used, a contemplative process to keep 
keep acting and living out of a sense of what is really, you know, how I would say is most deeply meaningful, he would use the word virtue. So it's, it's a life lived in, 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 in accord with, the, the, with what you find, with, you know, with virtue and, and an overall satisfaction. So it's not about like having like pleasures, although that's sort of life. Turns out, you know, a, a byproduct of that is kind of an ease, but it's not a life lived after running after short-term pleasures. So, um, so that's that's what that word means. Um, so, so uh, David, should, should I read the? I should not read the yeah. names, or should I? Well, you can you can address um, the asker, yeah, and I'll just make sure you read the question, yeah, because other people won't of see course. them. Yeah. Thanks. So, so David George, who's written, he's an economist, that I'm so happy to hear here, David, um, has written, written a lot on this kind of question about meta-preferences, this question around having the preferences of the preferences that you seem to, you know, the preferences that, preferences that you have. And so like, you know, these kind of dimensionality issues. And um, he, he, one of the things he writes about is that um, this, uh, the vision that we have here is, runs counter to the, ever, to the growing corporate control of education. He says, free inquiry is in trouble in training dispensable, reliable workers is the mission that continues to take hold. I am, yes, I am very concerned about that also. And you can see here, this is about not initiating a particular kind of inquiry in the sense of what should be the result with students, but them really looking at what deeply meaningful to them, whatever that is, whatever that is, and sustaining a kind of deep uh, reflection about that rather than trying to produce some kind of like narrow outcome. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe I can get back to these questions. Uh, let's get several here and look down here. Uh, um, can you please provide some more examples of class activities? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, yes. there's a little bit of time. You know, um, you have a whole list there. It's very tantalizing. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, it's rare. Uh, thank you so much for, I, I want to, again, thank, thank you very much for attending. I really, I, it's really wonderful to be able to share this work. And it's, uh, I, I feel, it feels kind of vulnerable to do so because I've been thinking about this for so long and it's kind of like coming together. So I really appreciate um, you, you, you know, responding. And by the way, please feel free to email me afterwards because, mm -hmm. um, I can give kind of a quick thumbnail sketch of these exercises, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to lay them out, do you know what I mean? So let me give you, uh, like, let me just quickly do, like, uh, positional concerns, okay? Um, so positional concerns are these concerns that, you know, um, that you are, your, you, your well-being is a function of your position amongst a group of other people. And so, for example, if, you know, if everybody had, you know, Harvard MBAs were asked, for example, you know, this kind of famous example, Harvard, you know, Harvard MBAs were asked, what would you prefer? Um, to, if everyone in your class made $120,000 and you made $90,000, or you made $85,000 or $80,000, but, but these, these are, the numbers aren't quite right, but $80,000 and everybody made $70,000, well, they were willing to take, they were, they were willing to do the latter. They, were, they would rather be, they would rather take a hit and be at the top rather than at the bottom. You can imagine in a, you know, in a dynamic sense of worried about what's going to happen in the future, why that might be the case. But you can imagine also, um, I ask my students, well, so suppose I, you know, tell you all that the trustees of Amherst College have given me money to give to you. And what I'm going to do is give you each some money. So I give, you know, $25 to each of you and to you, and I point to someone in the class and I say, I give 10. Now, the student, the student who would receive the 10 came to class expecting nothing. Now they have 10. But I would imagine they'd be thinking a little bit, something along the lines of, why did everyone else get 25 when I got 10? So I, we lay that out, and, the, and we, I do this prior to looking at papers like by Easterlin and others who claim, in fact, that that is the nature of positional concerns. Other people's benefits are, in fact, negative to you, okay? Mm. And you can imagine exercises that complicate that, that have students recognize that that's true some of the time, but certainly not all of the time. So I, I, if, you're, if you please email me, I can give you the, the exact way I do those kinds of exercises. But the exercises are designed prior to reading the literature to get, a, to get students to recognize in their own behavior that sometimes they want 
others to benefit. Sometimes they may find themselves jealous of others, and sometimes it's neutral. And through the exercise, they realize, oh my goodness, I create the individuals with whom I compare myself. How do I do that? And now when they read the article uh, with the abstraction around the, you, you know, how we would say it in econ ease in the utility function, about how these positional currents function, they recognize, ah, it's more complicated than that. In fact, I select my Joneses, and maybe, oh my goodness, I could change that relationship. Hmm. So now the relationship with these readings is much more uh, interesting. You know, so in, I do, you know, I do um, examples with the ultimatum game, and you know, I like for that. For that, you know, the ultimatum game is this game where you, um, you give a, a, a paired group. Um, say to, to a paired group, you give one of them a certain amount of uh, money, for example, like ten dollars, and you to the to the one individual who who could be anonymous or not, how, however you want to play this, um, you, you tell that individual who has the ten dollars, you have to share some of that money with the other person, okay? And the offer you make to the other person can either be accepted or denied. If it's accepted, the money is split as you offered it. If the other person uh, rejects it, no one gets anything. Okay? So what they do is they have a heuristic, which is basically that most people pick 50-50. That's what they do. Okay? And if the person on the other side you know, gets something less than 50-50, they can get a little agitated. So they, they, what it turns out is like anything below, let's say, on $10, pretty much below $2.53 dollars people reject. So I, pl I have that. I have them kind of imagine that game as them as the you know that, them as someone accepting them and some them and someone um, you know offering and the modal answer is fifty. Sometimes and the modal answer for rejecting is anything under fifty percent. I reject. Okay. So then I, I use I give that, and that's with ten dollars. Then I say let's do that with a thousand dollars. Well, the modal answer is still fifty percent. And I ask them after they've turned in their you know, papers or their, or their, you know, these little these sheets with their numbers on it, say, you know, if you were offered $300, knowing that someone else has seven, would three, so you came to class expecting nothing, and now you have an opportunity to make $300, would you actually reject? And the answer often is no. And this, this is a kind of sense of just like a, this is an unaware heuristic, which is 50-50 is fair. And there are a variety of other examples that I could provide, but I don't have time to go through them. And I'm happy to, uh, you know, give you more examples if you email me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's see. What are we doing? So Thanks, Dan. <laughs> this, this yeah. Is. No, it's a, it's a wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. So take a moment. Yeah, have another look at the questions. But it, it does, it brings up this idea of, you know, how can you... Um, inspire them to extend compassion beyond self and tribe? You know, is there something that is some kind of exercise that you would bring toward that end? Oh, yeah. Things? I mean, yeah. So, so I'm happy to, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's, let me just give you two examples. I didn't, so one is in a, one's in a class context and one is a little experiment. I, had, I, re, I did that ultimatum game with two groups of students. I have, I, have, I, have a, I have a sample of about 60 and I um, split them randomly into two groups. One group, I had them listen to our own Mirabai Bush's huh. Loving Kindness Meditation, which is an MP3 on our website. Now, nothing around, it was not framed as loving kindness, it just starts off with like, you know, sit, sit comfortably and so forth, okay? And I had them listen to that. It's, it's, it's about 12 minutes long. And then I had the other group listen to a MP3 of a description of Yellowstone National Park. Okay? <laughs> and then I had them um, make offers and accept. And what occurred was even with that very little intervention, the group that had listened to the loving kindness meditation were more generous than the ones who did not. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Now, in the class, what I do is I have, I, I do this exercise. I have the students um, go through a variety of um, allocation schemes. And one of the schemes is the following. I say, imagine 
and, and this is all just on a piece of paper. They're not, there's no preface to this. They come into class. I say, okay, we're going to do this thing today. I hand out pieces of paper. One of the scenarios that they, they have to respond to is the following. You, they, they are asked how they'd like to allocate some money. Don't worry about where it comes from, what the, what the opportunity costs of this money are, just your allocation, that's all. And the, the, it goes this way. Suppose that we, you, you, are, you, you, are, you are asked how you would like to divide up um, some, some 2,000, you know, some, some money, so, such that so a bunch of money, and, and depending on how many students there are, I use a, a total for that. And I say, okay, imagine we, 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 we split the class into two groups, group A and group B. You're in group A, okay? And you can either make, you could split the money such that everybody in group A and everybody in group B gets $100. This is your classmates, okay, remember. Or everybody in group A, remember you're in group A, gets $100. And everybody in group B gets $200. And no one will ever know what you've done, okay? What I get is, I've done this a number of times. And what I get is about 60 to 65 percent of the students select the first allocation rather than the second allocation. <laughs> and they have a variety of answers why they want to do that. But then I, later on in the class, unprompted, I ask them to imagine someone that, they're, that they have a lot of gratitude for. And imagine that person, and we do kind of a gratitude exercise with, with, with you know, with them, with them imagining the person, you know, you know, saying whatever they want to to that person and so forth. And then at the end of it, out of nowhere, I say, remember that allocation we did several weeks before? Now, just imagine that everybody's person that was standing in front of them is now group B. How would you now allocate the money? Hundred, everyone in group A gets hundred. Everyone in group B gets hundred, or a hundred, two hundred. And let's suppose that the the the, the people that, that that the people in group B, those that everyone found you know had you know, had a kind of feeling of generosity toward, would never ever possibly know. Right. Okay. That that was the case. In every class, the number that fall that, that wants to do the second allocation goes to a, either a hundred percent or 99%. Wow. It doesn't take much, really. <laughs> it doesn't take much. And they, and, they, and they can realize, like, wow, generating a sense of connection. Yeah. Now, notice that that's not strategic altruism. Mm. It's not like, oh, I'll help that person because maybe they'll help me in the future or something like that. Or they'll know that I really appreciate it. They, make it clear. They will never know that this occurred. So those are a couple examples. Yeah, wonderful. Well, there's, there's such a strong social orientation in economics, and to see, yeah, it's just to... It's about social behavior. <laughs> but there's Brian, one question. Yeah, there's one question one, yeah we have time for one more. Go answer. for it. <laughs> okay. So now, there are many others, and I apologize. I'm not getting to all of them. They're all really great. It's just that I have this long list. <laughs> so it's like we, I just got down to Paul's, and it's... So. We won't lose them either. There's a record of them, yeah. and so you can oh, look at them oh, and cool. even um, can, even address them. them. Yeah, exactly. After the webinar. Oh, that'd be nice. I'd like to. I'd be okay. very happy to do that because it would be a great exercise for me. Cool. So, so Paul writes. You suggest that contemplation helps us identify what we real, what one really wants, but this assumes that wanting is an instrument of happiness. But how about wanting itself? Is it actually a part of happiness, even life satisfaction? What about traditions that question the relationship? This is very interesting because it's the nature of wanting that you're asking about. And every tradition that you're talking about, that's, uh, you know, this, the notion of these tr this tradition about the, the, between desire and wanting is around the very delicate and subtle concept of intention. Vision, you see, is an intention. It might have very little to do with something you might think of as desire or pleasure. Now, you know, in the, you know, uh, it, it's not, it's not, it's not so much. It's like if you want, you could frame it about like what you really want, but then you've got this problem of this word want sitting for a variety of different kinds of things. So the dimensionality of that word is rather relatively important. The intention and the cultivation of that deep meaning. 
th that cultivation and the inquiry could be, as Beth was talking about earlier, very unpleasant. Very unpleasant. You might not desire that process, nor might you desire actions that are consistent with that mm -hmm. vision. In fact, it is often more expedient to act counter to our vision. And that is why we do so so often, <laughs> because the immediate impact of acting in this kind of expediency for desire, you know, the, the, the second model that I had, I don't know if you still can see the screen, but, um, you know, the, you know, sorry, <laughs> this is going to give you, you know, this, this picture. Yeah. You know, doing this, but establishing a deep inquiry, not so much, and you could think about it as what we really want, but that um, would, would have to be kind of, would, that would have to be opened out in a much more subtle kind of way, because it's a, it's, it's a deep intention for something that might lead you to actions that actually might be quite confronting and unpleasant, resulting in a world in which lives out a vision that you're deeply committed to, like, you know, not you know, eating this animal that you that hasn't been raised ethically, but it's really tasty <laughs> <laughs> and cheap, and also cheap, way cheaper. Right. So it's really, that, 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 but that's but that's a conversation that would be I would yeah. really love to engage in uh, longer. But I hope that kind of yeah. suggests the the angle that I would that I would take for it because I'm not just saying this is kind of like a, there's a there's a really wanting and then there's a, a wanting wanting. You know, it's it's a, it's a different kind of it's almost a different dimensionality. Mm. But it is a pathway to get grounded in, in that vision, to, to follow that, that path that begins with, with wanting, I think, and uh, wonderful. Yeah, very, very suggestive, very, um, I see there's some questions there. Can we continue this conversation? Um, I think definitely the answer is we would love to do that, uh, whether through subsequent webinars um, or through other means that that come forward through the association. Um, thanks so much, Dan, for, for your presentation. Thanks to everyone who attended. Um, before I sign off, I just want to say that our next webinar in, uh, in February will be with Brad Grant, who is Professor of Architecture at Howard University. And he will present Listening to Our Eyes, Seeing as Meditation. It will be an exploration of teaching using the phys physical and visual environments as a means to design. Um, wow. So that'll, that'll be on February 19th from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, we'll put registration up on the website and send you an email announcement uh, with more information soon. So I hope you might be able to join us again. But for now, farewell until we meet again. Can I, can I be yeah, go ahead. Beth, before you go? Sure. Yeah. Just how will, if I want to answer these, sorry. Yeah. I know I could do this offline. Like, so people know, if they've asked the question, where yeah. should they look for the answer? Or we, oh, I, yes. I, no, I'm glad I you asked. Their names or, how, how um, do I do this? Well, what do I do? The questions, do? The questions are in a print form um, in, our, in our webinar reports. And now when you, we post the webinar, which will be in a week or so, we could include um, a list of questions that, you know, you'd like to address um, in a text file that would go along with the webinar work. Oh, I, I, will, yep. I, will, I, will, I will do that. I will do that okay. for the questions. They're very, it would be great for me to go through. Great. Oh, and, and Carrie just said she'll email everyone, so we'll follow up with that. Great. All right. Farewell, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.